Give it up for Jeremy Corbyn! this has given and this is a moment when I always think of my dear friend the late Tony great ben. Tony Benn. And so many others that have spoken here at Glastonbury, E.P. Thompson, Bob Crow and so many others that have made such a contribution to the process and thought within our movement. I just spoke, as you probably know, on the Pyramid stage, and I, I thanked Michael Evis because all those years ago, he had an inspiration about Glastonbury, and what I didn't know until I talked to him about it today, that both of us were at the Shepton Malik Folk Festival in 1970. Yes! Yes, I know that's ancient history for all of you in this room, it's fine. I understand that. It's long before you were all born. Or half of you, anyway. And uh, he had this uh, idea of a festival that could combine together music, peace, environment, culture and inspiration. And founded Glastonbury as a result of that. And I think we have to say a huge thank you to him. because it's a, it's a truism, I know, but if you bring people together, they talk to each other, they think about things, and that sort of creativity develops from one person to another, and great ideas and great movements and great strengths come. And that is what is happening now, here, in the 21st century, across, not just across this country, but across the rest of the world, that sense of people coming together. Now, we've just been through the general election campaign, and uh, at the start of the campaign, to be quite honest, nobody knew that election was coming because none of us had had the chance to go walking in the mountains of Croft Old Gasly and have an epiphany moment. Next time I need to know what's going on, I shall cycle round Old Gasly and then I'll be clear. Because uh, the election was sprung upon us, yes, and the commentariat uh, analysed it and wrote it off and wrote us off and wrote everybody off and announced that the future of the left was dead, the future of socialism was dead, the future of everything was dead except the future that they dreamt of, which is of a society based on injustice, inequality and growing poverty. very different happened. Something very, very different happened indeed. People were fed up, absolutely fed up, with being told how to think. Being told, being told by newspapers and commentators how to think. Being told that poverty is inevitable, that regional injustice and inequality in our society is inevitable, and that if there are poor people in the country, there are homeless people in the country, there are people working on zero hours contracts, people working for minimum wage, or in some cases even less, then somehow or other it's their own fault and it's an, a, a, an inevitability of modern economics. 
I tell you what, it isn't, it never will be so long as we are. We will challenge those assumptions. And so, as the election campaign begun, we were planning and already doing our campaign. I attended over a hundred events during the campaign all over the country. The turning point was the launch of our manifesto, for the many, not the few. That document, a reflection of policies of the Labour Party, obviously, of trade unions, obviously, but also of the creativity and ideas of so many groups and so many people all around the country, all put together in two weeks. And in this possibly very short interregnum period between the end of that election and the next election, let us develop the creativity there think through the ideas on housing, environment, health, social security, education, all the policies that are there and our view of the rest of the world. So that when the next election comes, and I hope it will be very, very, very soon, Many people I'd like to thank for their contribution to that manifesto, some of whom are here. I'd particularly like to thank our Director of Research, who did so much for it, Andrew Fisher, my good friend, who did a fantastic job in preparing it. And also, there's a very shy, retiring, calm, zen-like individual, just like me, who's in the audience here today, who is a great thinker of economic justice and how to eliminate poverty in the future. Can I hear it please for John McDonnell? Some of that was ironic actually. <laughs> John. John, thank you so much for what you do, and thank you to all our team who stood fast during the most unbelievable yeah. onslaught. Yes! Yes! John McDonald! And also, Think for a moment of some of my colleagues and what they've been through with the abuse they've received in the media and I'm sorry to say on social media as well. The stuff that Diane Abbott has had to put up with, yeah. nobody should ever have to put up with. Yeah. And so, to those that have been through the storm, I say thank you very much because going through a storm is what our predecessors and what our ancestors did. And what Left Field does is give you the space to think and the creativity that goes with it. I was only able to make a short speech on the main stage, but what I was trying to do there was draw the lesson from history. Because we have to understand a whole historical process that we are part of. Those people that formed or tried to form trade unions in the late 18th and 19th century. Those people that stood up against the impoverishment of the already poor in the early 19th century. Those farm workers that were driven off the land in order to become wage slaves in factories in big cities. All made a contribution to our history. They all campaigned for democracy. The Chartists set out an idea of what a democratic society could be like. And in a limited form, a very limited form, they won the right to vote from a gradually increasing franchise. And there is an historical continuum between the growth of the franchise and the growth of social justice legislation in Britain. From Factories Act 
through to Education Act, through to national insurance and a form of social security. But the turning point was actually votes for women at the time of the First World War. And the way in which eventually, the way in which eventually a lot of men in, who were then dominating the labour movement came to understand that. And legislation was eventually passed. But we still have a long way to go yes. on gender discrimination, on race discrimination, on homophobia, on inequality, on Islamophobia, or anti Semitism, on anti racism altogether. Because the only future there can ever be is if we're united in what we do and what we want to achieve. Yes. And what this election campaign did was, I believe, unleashed a lot of thought and a lot of inspiration in people. So when we brought out the manifesto and we organized an election campaign that was different in every way from that organized by the Tory party and our opponents, we went out and talked to people, we went out and met people, and you know what? We even debated with people. your ideas, then you're not afraid to discuss them with anybody. And I think that is probably a very important message. And the election campaign mobilised a lot of people. It mobilised a lot of people partly through the brilliant voter registration campaign that lots and lots of people were involved in, those in the Labour Party, in trade unions and lots of independent groups and somewhere around two million people registered in two weeks in order to be able to vote in the election. Many of those, many of those were very young people who had never voted before. And what it was about was simply saying, actually, I think we've had enough of the political elites, the economic elites, the corporate elites, giving us this kind of neocon economic narrative that the zenith of equality in the world was somewhere around the post-war 1950s settlement when welfare states were created, when public ownership was seen as a reasonable, sensible thing to do. But since then, they kind of say, okay, you've had your fun, let's go back to business as usual. Let's go back and privatize. Let's go back and reduce tax at the top end. Let's go back and cut services, <laughs> cut opportunities, and cut education and housing opportunities for the poorest and the rest. And let's say to the younger generation, grow up, Forget about being better off than your parents. Forget about the ideas of free education. Forget about the ideas of free health care. Forget about the ideas of a public insurance policy that gives you security in old age. Be numero uno, be number one, be an individual. And if a few people lose out, sorry, but it's their fault. Well, I'll tell you what's happened. And it, I think social media has had a very big part to play in this. People talk to each other and challenge the orthodoxy. And in challenging and in that orthodoxy, a lot of other things become very possible. And that's what engaged so many younger people, as well as older people returning to politics, who had been driven away by the cynicism of the past. And that is why we had the campaign that we had. We had this incredible number of rallies and events all around the country and how so many people got involved in the campaign. And you know what? At the end of it, the increase in the Labour vote was the biggest at any time since 1945. went up in different proportions all over the country and it gave us sadly a hung parliament because I wanted something different I wanted a Labour majority in parliament but it didn't deliver for the Tories they didn't you're not hearing 
ain't so much about strong and stable these days, are you? <laughs> and you're not hearing so much about the coalition of chaos. Because it's there! It's come about! There is one already! And so, it's what we do now that is important. What we do now, how we act, what we do, and how we develop our ideas that is so important. Because politics is about economics, of course. It's also about social justice and all the issues that go with that, of course. But it's also about the creativity that is there in all of us. And what is so exciting about the way people have come together in this election campaign, here today at Glastonbury. They'll be there at the Durham Miners Gala in a couple of weeks' time. They'll be there at Tollpuddle in three weeks' time. They'll be there at all the other festivals and events around the country. Is the idea that you can have cultural creativity as well as economic thinking, as well as thinking of social justice. They are not compartments, they are part of a whole, an approach to our world and our life. live in a world where our children can dream, our children can hope, and I want to live in a world where the public gives every child a chance to learn a musical instrument yeah. in school. Yeah. And I want to live in a world where children don't go to school hungry, where they get a breakfast if they need one, and they all get a lunch together, because they don't have to pay for it. They don't get letters from the Department of Education saying, sorry, austerity means we've got to cut the funding per pupil, austerity means your school will get less, and if you think you can't cope, we'll start a collection in the local neighbourhood and see if the local residents are able to chip in and help you. Well, in a wealthy part of the country that might raise a few bob, but in a lot of places it won't raise anything, not because the local population or the parents don't love and value education because they simply haven't got the spare cash to help out in the school. And so we will fund education properly, we will fund housing properly, and we will fund put forward an economic strategy that will be able to achieve these things. And my goodness, didn't it create a lot of stir? All we're saying, and it's not much, is that 95% of the people will see no change in their taxation. 5%, only 5% will be expected to pay a bit more that the rest of us might be a bit better off. And our children might get the education they deserve and our older people the social care they deserve. So it is about economics and how you approach things. And I want a Labour government to be measured by its success. Its success in reducing poverty. Its success in reducing and eliminating gender inequality. Its success in making sure that racism is expunged from our society. A success in making sure that everyone has a decent and reasonable chance. But countries and economies don't live in isolation. The question of how we view issues globally and how we view security. What is security? Is security the ability to uh, fight? Or is it the ability to understand where insecurity and threats come from? Because we live in a world where there is environmental disaster waiting around the corner and indeed happening to people in many parts of the world. Where deforestation, degradation of the environment leads to environmental refugees. We cannot go on destroying, damaging, polluting and degrading our planet at the rate that we are. So none of us 
would be afraid to pick up the phone to Donald Trump and simply say, Donald, you are wrong. On the Paris A foreign policy that doesn't sell arms to dictators that they might yes. oppress their own people. Yes. And one that recognises the human tragedy of refugees and what they're going through. During my lifetime, I've had the opportunity and chance to visit many refugee camps around the world. and. Uh, they are sad and desperate and sometimes very, very dangerous places. But they're also full of people brimming with ideas and with imagination who want to contribute and to achieve. One of the most moving experiences I had was visiting a refugee camp in Syria before this current war started some time ago. I was talking to a family who were living in tents on the border with Iraq. They basically were in no person's land, stuck. Cold, horrible weather. They've been trying to heat their tents with um, portable gas heaters, and sadly, some of those tents had caught fire, and some people had been burnt to death in an inferno of burning plastic in those tents. A horrible, horrible way to go. And I was talking to a family, and this young girl, she's about 12, 13, something like that, lovely, bright kid, really sparkling and full of energy and full of life, but there she was, in a tent, with apparently very little hope. So I sat down and talked to her quite a long time, and I learned a lot from her about her life and what had gone on before, and some of it was very traumatic and very sad. And I said, what do you want to achieve in your life? And she looked at me, and you know what she said? She said, she was very polite, she said, sir, I want to be a doctor. <laughs> what an amazing kid. incredibly skilled people of the future are there, stuck in refugee camps, stuck in poverty in this country, stuck in poverty in other places. Surely we need an approach to the world that recognises the human spirit and the human condition. When you work together, you achieve things. And that they have those rights and that justice. And so, Left field is the place where we come together. Left field is the place where we try to understand each other and try to look at way, the way we do things for the future. Absolutely immediately, a general election will come, I hope very soon. We're on it, we're ready for it. And we're gonna knock on those doors all over the country. We're gonna knock on those doors in places that have seen no investment for a very long time that have seen poverty, that have seen deindustrialization, that have seen deunionization, that have seen the kind of sport direct form of employment taking over. And say to them, a Labour government will invest, John McDonnell will ensure there is a national investment bank covering all parts of the country. And say to them, workers' rights are important, the rights to be represented at work by a trade union from day one of your employment are important. And a decent living wage is important. And say to those areas, we're here to work with you to create that local viable economy, to create that level of real security in society. That surely is the message we can and will put forward. And this isn't a young versus old thing, as Theresa May seemed to think it was. It's not. Young people lose out because they're exploited in apprenticeships, because they're laid with debt for going to university. Because they're told the future doesn't really belong to them. And old people are told, well, you're a bit of a burden, so we're going to take your house off you to look after you. I tell you what. Let's do something far more sensible and recognise that everybody matters. Have a national care service that cares for those who need it. And a 
an economic strategy that deals with it. And yes, it does mean, it does mean, yes, it does mean some redistribution of wealth within our society. And that has got to be the right thing to do. But you know, there's events that happen at times in our history that are actually turning points and seminal. I remember when a block of flats in East London called Ronan Point collapsed because of faulty design, bad building and dangerous conditions, gas main exploded, the whole place collapsed with all the attendant catastrophe that went with it. A couple of, well, not so long ago, we saw Grenfell Tower, a towering inferno in the midst of actually the richest borough in the country. People living in poverty, living in danger, in a place that just literally went up in smoke straight away and took, we know of at least 79 lives, possibly more, that are going to have perished because of that fire. Not one of those people should have died. That fire was wholly and totally preventable. Somewhere along the line, tenants living in that block, intelligent, creative people warned of the danger. What happened? They were ignored, utterly ignored. Why? Because they were tenants, because they were poor people, because they were working class communities, they were utterly ignored. I'll tell you what, I think Grenfell Tower and all the other concerns that are quite rightly now being addressed all over the country about the dangers in tower blocks of cladding materials being put on are going to see a step change. A step change in attitudes towards housing, a step change in attitudes towards communities. And I want to see a government in office that doesn't see housing policy as a series of market opportunities, but sees it as a collective responsibility to house the homeless and enjoy decent housing for all. And so we have this space this weekend here, we have this space in our minds, we have this space in our communities to organize and create, to develop a stronger, better economy, to protect our planet, to have a better approach to human rights, to have a real approach to social justice and a real issue about the redistribution of power and wealth within our society. I don't know exactly when this election is going to come. I want it to come very, very soon. We will be voting against this government's program next week in Parliament. very alternative approach to that this government is taking and that will be put to the vote in Parliament. Love you! I want us to win that vote if we can. Oh, we're going to do everything we can to do that. We're going to push the whole way the whole time. Those nearly 13 million people who came to vote for us on June the 8th did so for a purpose and a reason because they saw the chances of doing things differently and doing things better. And whilst I never comment, don't read and not totally interested in opinion polls, I can tell you this, every indication I've got is there's an awful lot more people come to the same conclusion. I want to take this opportunity I'm thanking you all for being here and thanking all those that organised left field over the years. Bringing the voices of peace, of human rights and justice, bringing the voices of alternatives. You never know when you drop a pebble in a pool where the ripples will end up. When Michael Evis started Glastonbury all those years ago, he probably never realised where it will all end up. And I want to pay tribute to those that have stood the course for so many years in offering us hope. Those people who marched in the southern states of the United States to end the colour bar and end the racism there. Those people that struggled to end apartheid in South Africa. Those that stood up for land rights in Latin America. Those people that have stood up against the rich and the powerful. 
from around the world. And um, kind of strong solidarity with them all around the world. And I want to pay, pay a special and very personal thank you to Billy Bragg for the work that he's done over the years. brought alive the music of Woody Guthrie. What he's done is brought alive Woody those Guthrie. hopes that were there in the desperation of Dust Bowl refugees in the United States in the 1930s. What he's also done is brought together the idea that there is a different version of English, of Scottish, of Welsh, of British history, which is one of ordinary people standing up for justice, standing up to change things and improve things. There is radical tradition there. I quoted, I quoted, I quoted Shelley on stage, but there are so many other poets, working class poets like John Clare and so many others that give us that inspiration. And what I want us to do is be proud of our traditions, proud of our principles, proud of our demands, confident of the future we are going to bring. Confident that we can unite people to defeat, defeat the narrow lack of vision, poverty of ambition and inequality, which is all that the Tories offer. And offer something that is so different and so inspirational. So I simply say to the Prime Minister, which has got time this afternoon to be watching Glastonbury. We're ready for another election as soon as you like. Yeah! We do it. We do it for those. We do it for those who went before, and we do it for those to come afterwards. Yes! Let's do it above all. Together. Yeah. Thank you.